Good morning, church. Let's, um, let's go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. Well, last week, we kind of set the stage for Elijah's ministry as we saw the, the battle lines, as they are, drawn between um, the increasing wickedness in the northern kingdom of Israel under King Ahab and God's response through this man, Elijah, who will be the subject of our study these next several weeks. And it's an interesting shift in tone as we come to our passage this morning, because whereas, whereas last week was very uh, big picture, it was kingdom oriented, it was kings and rulers and, and, and large swaths of people, the, the tone and the, the scope this morning narrows down considerably. And rather than going and confronting the powers that be, Elijah finds himself with a single woman and her son, a widow. And whatever else we see this morning, we see that God is is at work in more than just the macro, political, societal, social movements of the day. He's intimately involved with individual people. That's good news for those of us who don't tip the scales of national news, that God still hears, he cares, and he interacts with us. At the same time that he's trying to prove to a nation his trustworthiness, his praiseworthiness, he's doing the same thing this morning with one woman and one prophet, for that matter. This is Elijah's faith journey as well, as he's teaching them lessons and how to trust him in the midst of trying circumstances. This past summer, we decided it was finally time to teach our kids to ride their bikes. They'd had bikes for a while, they'd had training wheels for a while, but my kids are not uh, known for being risk takers. They they don't love trying new things. So uh, we had tried to get them to ride their bikes before, but it had not gone well. Let's just say that. And I couldn't figure out why, because I I was telling them exactly what to do. And in fact, I was telling them exactly what they were doing wrong, very clearly, sometimes loudly. It couldn't have been more obvious how to ride a bike if you just listened to me. But inevitably, uh, they would go out, they wouldn't do well, they'd have to listen to me yapping And in my house, at least, that tends to lead towards tears, frustration, feeling like, I'll never get this right, I can't do this. And then we finally just mercifully say, forget it, shut it down, we'll try again later. Well, this past summer was different. I was like, we have an eight-year-old, it's it's beyond time to to figure this out. So we, 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 we were determined to do it. And what I eventually learned is that it was pretty easy to see why it wasn't working. I I was trying to teach them a skill the way that I would have wanted to learn it and the way that I, as an adult, would have wanted to learn it. See, I I have this little perfectionist tendency in me, and so I want to know what I'm doing wrong. I need need that constant correction. I want to know what it is so I can be aware of it, so I can fix it, so I can get it done. So I want people barking at me. I want them to point out this flow. No, you're doing this wrong. No, stop. Stop. I want that. But it turns out an eight-year-old girl doesn't. Who knew? (laughs) So finally, we we, we knew we needed a different course of action, so we turned to the source of all modern wisdom. We we went to YouTube. And it's, it's embarrassing to say that we watched like one video for like 10 minutes, and then we went outside for like 20 minutes, and it was done. It was, they, were, they were up, and they were going. And you think, how, how did I do so bad for two years that one random woman on YouTube fixes the problem instantly? In hindsight, the differences were, were obvious. Because what a kid has to learn when they're riding a bike, more than anything else, is how to balance, right? You don't have that, that, that uh, training wheel to keep you upright, so you have to learn how to feel that for yourself and to keep the bike under you. 
And so just to, to boil this all down to, to a very short period of time, what, what we did is, is we helped them to get their balance, and then we, we, we had them go, and, and then you stop. You don't, you don't keep holding on anymore. You let them go, and you let them feel that balance for themselves, and you only intervene if they're getting ready to actually kind of topple over. So you're kind of walking behind them, and you're, you're ready to, to, to stick a hand out here and a hand out here, and, and what you're trying to get them to do is to keep moving forward, no matter what. Just keep pedaling, keep balancing, keep doing that, and trust that I've got you, right? So you don't have to let go. You don't have to take your foot off. You just keep going, I'm right here the whole time. <laughs> and it was shockingly effective. It worked instantly, and we've got two kids that love to ride their bikes now. So they're learning two things. They're learning, number one, to trust themselves, to gain control. But just as importantly, they're learning that they have a safety net. They're learning that there's someone there to catch them if things don't go right. And as we look at Elijah today and we see this encounter with this woman of Zarephath, we see, I think, a similar kind of lesson. Right? They're, they're both, in their own ways, learning to just keep walking forward as God leads them. And to trust that if things get crazy, if things get out of balance and out of control, that there's someone there to keep them upright. You don't have to fear. You don't have to trust yourself. You've got this. God's got this more, more accurately. He's able to provide a way even when there doesn't seem to be any way possible. And I think that's a lesson we could all do to learn and relearn this morning as well. So let's look together at God teaching this lesson in trust in 1 Kings 17. I'm going to start us, uh, probably contrary to a paragraph break in your Bible, but I'm going to start us in verse 7. And since we are kind of catching it right in the middle, just to, just to, to remind you, to catch us back up to speed, we left Elijah last week after this encounter, after his confrontation with Ahab, his pronouncement of judgment that there would be no rain upon the land. God, God took him to this brook, Kareth which is east of the Jordan, outside of the land of Israel. And there, we, we saw last week, he was provided, he had water, the, the ravens are bringing him food and meat. Uh, and this morning, we see kind of the, the departure from that place into this new place. So I'm going to be reading from 1 Kings 17. I'm going to start in verse 7 and take us to the end of the chapter, verse 24. <clears throat> Hear God's word this morning to us. After a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, Make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, and neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, 
Have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Let's pray. Father, we believe that your word is truth this morning. We pray it to be spoken clearly into our ears and into our hearts that we may learn and see what you would have us see this morning. Teach us, instruct us, change us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as we look at our text this morning, there's two pretty clearly connected but separate accounts involving Elijah and this widow of Zarephath. And in each circumstance, in each account, we have an unexpected situation, some unexpected circumstance, followed by a rather incredible response from the Lord. So our our outline, if you're following along in your bulletin, will follow that kind of a pattern this morning. An unexpected situation and an incredible provision. And both of these together teach us something of what it means to walk forward trusting that God is always able to sustain us, that God is always able to provide no matter the circumstances that we find. So if we were to boil this all down this morning to one little thesis statement, I think it's this, that in unexpected circumstances, God is able to make incredible provision. So we'll see this in two accounts, two lessons, so to speak, and what it means to trust. So again, we leave Elijah last week well cared for in this river valley outside of Ahab's reach, but then we see in verse 7, that the brook has dried up. God intends for him to move on. He doesn't intend to supernaturally sustain it in any kind of way. And so he tells him in verse 8, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. And already, if, we, if, if we're paying attention to details here, we see kind of our first unexpected element. And here, I want to call this an unexpected destination. God leads Elijah to a place that I don't think you and I would be very keen to go were we in his shoes because Zarephath, we're told, is in the land of Sidon. And if you have a map somewhere in your Bible, the, lands of, the, the cities of Tyre and Sidon are coastal cities in modern-day Lebanon just north of Israel along the Mediterranean. And Zarephath was a small town roughly halfway in between them. But it's that mention of Sidon in particular that's, that's notable because if you remember last week, we've met someone from Sidon. Her name is Jezebel. She's not friendly. And so God is leading Elijah from this sheltered, protected river valley outside of Ahab's jurisdiction directly into Jezebel's backyard the heart of Baal worship that is infecting the nation of Israel. And we know from the next chapter that Jezebel is spending her days hunting down prophets of the Lord to execute them and surely would have been interested in getting her hands on Elijah himself, the one responsible in their twisted thinking for this ongoing drought. And so God leads Elijah behind enemy lines, so to speak. Rather unexpected, probably unwelcome from Elijah, but he doesn't complain. He dutifully goes. But there's one more little unexpected element because we see in verse 9, not only is he to go to Zarephath, he's to go, and, and God says he's commanded a widow there to feed him. Now, what could a widow have to offer in terms of shelter and provision. In ancient society, widows were probably the single most desperate and poverty-stricken, vulnerable demographics. We didn't exactly have gender equality in the workplace back then. 
And so if you were a widow, your husband, your, your source of provision and income is dead, if you didn't have a family to go back to, then you really didn't have many options. There weren't a lot of hiring signs for widows in that day. And so here's a woman that almost assuredly is destitute with no financial means to provide for herself, as we'll see confirmed in our account today. And God says, this is the person who's going to take care of you. Shocking. So Elijah, in the midst of drought and famine, goes to a pagan nation, hostile in its orientation towards the worship of God. He goes to a widow who would have no earthly means of providing even for herself, much less a stranger. And let's not forget a Gentile. Elijah crosses racial and ethnic lines in his association with this woman. There's zero reason that this would be the place that Elijah would find himself if it were not for the direct voice of God. And that's significant for us as we think about just the the tenderness of God in this moment towards this woman, but it also points forward to a very significant reality. Jesus made mention of this very fact in Luke chapter four. He stands up, he goes to the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth, and he reads from Isaiah 61, this prophecy of one who would come anointed by God. He says, he reads the words, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then, to make clear that this is not just a passage chosen at random, he says in highly significant terms, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'm that guy, he says. Isaiah 700 some odd years before, talked about one who would be anointed by the Lord to do these things, and I'm telling you it's me. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the people start to mumble. Really? That guy? Don't we, don't we know him? That, that's, that's Joseph's kid, right? You're that? What are you talking about? And they start to, they start to grumble. And Jesus, surely anticipating this and knowing this, he says, he goes on in Luke 4, truly I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine over all the land and Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And if you know the rest of that account, they didn't take very kindly to that statement by Jesus. But he was drawing upon something highly significant. This isn't just a woman chosen at random by God. It's not just that she's poor. It's not just that she's needy. There were plenty of needy, poor people in Israel. Jesus makes that point very clear. Jesus' point, echoing the, the, the situation of Elijah is that when Israel was in a state of rebellion, right, refusing to listen to the voice of the Lord, that it is often that their blessing, the promised blessing of God's presence, God's promises are taken from them in that moment and bestowed upon outsiders, those foreign and alien to the covenant promises of God. And so in this morning, in this text this morning, we see this this beautiful uh, reality of God drawing near to this woman with, with no earthly hope, no spiritual hope either for that matter, but God in his grace and mercy visiting her, showing kindness to her. But even more significantly, it looks forward to the, to the purposes of God, which were never confined to one nation, never confined to one people. God has always had his mind bigger than that. And it comes to, to, to bring to mind that, that the true king, would not just sit and rule over the nation of Israel, over the people of one ethnicity 
and race. No, he would sit over all nations, all peoples. And I don't know if any of you have any Jewish heritage, but I'm guessing that in this room, we're a bunch of stinking Gentiles. And so be thankful that God would show mercy to a widow in Zarephath. So it's a decidedly unexpected situation that Elijah finds himself in, not making a whole lot of sense from an earthly standpoint, sociologically, financially, and otherwise. But in the midst of this unexpected destination, we see here this first lesson, this incredible test. And it is a test. It's not simply a provision of God because there's, there's gonna be something attached to it, we'll see. So in Zarephath, Elijah goes, he meets this widow at the gate, he somehow discerns that this is the one that God told him about, and he says to her in verse 10, bring me a little water in a vessel. Now, it's worth remembering, this is the time of drought. We don't know how long. It's long enough for this river valley that Elijah was staying in to dry up. Water's probably a somewhat precious commodity at this point. And so this seemingly innocent statement is, is fairly loaded that Elijah gives her. But the widow dutifully goes and turns to obey. It must not have been that big a deal, I guess. But then Elijah calls out again in verse 11, and bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And now we see the problem, because this is not so easy an ask. And she replies with the, with the seriousness of, of, a, of a religious invocation. She says, as the Lord your God lives. Notice the use of the word your, by the way. It's the Lord your God lives. I have nothing baked. I don't have any food. And worse, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And then to drive home, just how desperate her situation is, she says, I'm, I'm gathering a couple of sticks. It's enough for one little fire to bake whatever I have left for me and my son. And then we're dead. She's, she's literally down to her last meal. She's starving to death. And even with the rules of ancient hospitality that would dictate that she would offer something to this stranger before herself, that's, that's too much. It's, it's a bridge too far. And she just can't, she can't go that far. She's at the end of her rope. She has nothing to give, literally, in this moment. And then Elijah says something that, that must strike her as incredible. Right? Verse 13, do not fear. Go and do as you've said, but first, first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. <laughs> I'd probably be inclined to say, I'm sorry, did you not hear what I just said? That's not possible. I mean, it, before we move on, I mean, it, let, let's understand the stakes. He, he's asking no less than, before you go and die, give me everything you have Empty your bank account. Give me every earthly possession that you have. And then you can go and, and go your way. He's asking, essentially, to give up her life and the life of her son that he can be sustained in that moment. But before she can say anything, which may be a good thing, because I wouldn't have anything good to say at this point, <laughs> along with this, Incredible request comes this equally incredible promise. Verse 14, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent. The jug of oil shall not be empty until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And so now the test is made clear, right? Elijah's saying, look, I, I, I'm giving you a chance out of this. I, I can show you a path, not just to have one more meal for one more night. You can be sustained indefinitely. But you have to exercise a little bit of faith. The order is important, right? He doesn't say, sure, go make your meal and then give me whatever you have left. He says, no, give it to me first and then do that. And in so doing, she has to be willing to stake literally all that she has on the word of this man that she's just met. 
All she has is a promise of the God of another nation able to provide for her, and she has to cast her entire livelihood on that moment. And, I, and I'm continually just blown away then that in verse 15, she went and did as Elijah said. Wow. I mean, would you? I, I, I don't say that to shame you. I, I, I just want to understand, I want us to understand together the, the stakes, the, the, the level of faith. And maybe it's just desperation, right? Maybe she thought, well, what do I have to lose? One less meal. But whatever it is, it's good news, by the way, that we're, the motivations for faith don't always have to be 100% pure. God, God takes that. Whatever the stakes, whatever the motivation, she does it. She puts her life on the line to do this, and God, unsurprisingly, keeps his word. Verse 15, they ate for many days. She thought they had one more left. Nope, they were sustained indefinitely, as long as God would have them. So it's, it's when she cast herself on the mercy of the Lord with nothing but his word to go on, no personal knowledge of him whatsoever. She, she knows he exists or that some people think he exists. That's all she had. But when she was willing to exercise that faith, God blessed her with far more than one more meal. He gave her the ability to withstand a famine that many others would not. And I think it's worth noting, he didn't, he didn't just give her a, a warehouse full of bread all at once, did he? No, he gave her just enough each day. You'll find when you go to the flour and the oil, each day you'll have just enough to get by. If we were to borrow Jesus' words here in the Lord's Prayer, she was given her daily bread, right? Each day when she went to see if God would come through, he would. But she only got that after she acted in faith. To put it again in, in, in New Testament terms, it was, it was once she laid her life down that she truly found her life saved. Jesus said in Mark 8, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. She could, have, she could have saved her life, so to speak, in that moment, right? She could have relied upon what she had to sustain her for one more night, and it would have been enough. But it was only when she gave up her life, so to speak, only when she laid down all that she had that she found that she had an abundance. God, God responded a hundredfold and more. And last week, we saw that one of the ways that God responded to the sin in Israel is, is through his, his absence, we said, right? With withdrawing his blessing, right? You, you want to worship Baal? Okay, fine. Let's see, let's see where Baal gets you in this moment. And here, I, I think we have kind of a slight tweak on that same principle, which is when, when you are left with, with whatever is, is the equivalent of your little bit of flour and oil, when you have something that you can depend on as what you think is the only source of your sustenance, all that you can put your hope in that you can see, sometimes God will test you in that moment to say, do you really think that that will be enough? Do you think that that can sustain you more than I can? And sometimes God roots out this dependence we have on fickle and finite things by asking us to give them up. And our hearts seize up with fear because I can't, that's, uh, but, but that's all I have. And God says, not, not really. You don't even have that if it weren't for my blessing. And, and if you trust me, you have way more than that. But that's the real question, isn't it? Do we trust him in that moment? When we put him to the test, so to speak, in Scripture, we find that he is more than willing to meet the need. And there's a place for prudence. There's a place for wisdom. We don't do 
needlessly foolish things, but when God is calling us to step out in faith, it's often a step with cost associated. It's, it's often not an easy thing to do because God is asking us in this moment to believe and trust him more than these little finite things that we think will be enough for us. So is there something in your life right now that you're relying on more than God's provision? Something, something that you think will sustain you? Maybe just in case he doesn't. Let me, let me challenge you this week to, to ask the Lord that. That's a scary question to ask. Let me challenge you to do that. To ask, is there, God, God am, I, am I trusting in myself in an area where I, where I could instead see you provide in an, in an abundant and extravagant way? Is there something you would ask me to give up that I can learn to trust in you? Maybe a financial sacrifice. Maybe a sacrifice of comfort in a relationship to, to, to step out in boldness, to have a conversation, to share the Lord with someone that you, that you worry may be the end of that relationship, or at least the, as you know it. Maybe God would be calling you today to give up that last little bit of flour and oil to see something far more abundant and extravagant from him. When God asks us to trust, he is more than willing to meet his end of the bargain. That's our first lesson this morning. It's about provision in a time of need, but we see one more kind of lesson here, and this one, an even more gutting one. Because this woman's faith journey is, is not yet over. Because in the midst of this provision, we see now another unexpected element, and this time it's an unexpected tragedy. And it's jarring to us. It ought to be jarring to us to see God meet this need and provide life for this woman and her son. And we think, well, and and that's the end of that story. But it's not. Because in verse 17, after this, sometime after this dramatic provision, they're eating together. God's come through. They're saved. And then her son becomes ill and his illness so severe, there's no breath in him. It must have seemed like a cruel joke, right? God had had come through. We we thought we were dead. We thought there was nothing left for us. And you showed up. And then, and then my son, he falls ill and dies? This is is for her. It's obviously emotionally gutting, but there's another element to this too because for, for a widow, the son is the only, again, earthly Chance that she has of being provided for again. Without a family, this woman's family apparently is not in the picture or or, or dead at this point. She can't go back. She has no husband. She either gets married again, which doesn't appear to be an option, or her son's able to eventually earn a living and provide for her. Now her son's dead. The death of her son is essentially the death of her. She has nothing left without this. That's secondary, obviously, to the grief that she's feeling in this moment. And so she's understandably devastated. And in verse 18, she, she comes to Elijah and she says, what have you against me, man of God? It's a phrase that occurs several times in the Bible. What to you and I, if we want to be really literal about it. What business do we even have with each other? We might translate that. Why are you here? And she says, you've come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. See, she's, she's blaming Elijah in a sense, but she's also blaming herself. She senses in this moment that there is, there is something about her that deserves punishment. God has finally found her out. And it's because this man of God is with her that now, now she's, it's as though God couldn't figure it out on his own. But now that he's paying attention to, to oh, oh, and there's this one. Well, I need to punish her. Let's take care of her son real quick. And this tells us that though she's, 
seen something of the goodness of the Lord, there's still a lot of paganism left in her, right? This, this journey in her faith and understanding of who God is is not over. She's thinking in Baal terms. She's thinking in the, the terms of the gods of the nations who could often be cruel and malicious even. And here, maybe we expect Elijah to defend himself. I didn't do anything. I was just told to come here. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say anything. It's not my fault. What are you blaming me for? Or if he's being more magnanimous, maybe we expect him to have some uh, great and profound statement on the Lord and his ways. They are beyond knowing. But he doesn't do that. He just says in verse 19, give me your son. And he carries him upstairs to his own bed and he cries out to God. I'm struck by this that I think Elijah is almost as shaken by this turn of events as this woman is. He doesn't get it. And so he, he comes up and he does the only thing he knows how to do at that moment. He goes to God. And I, and I think before we move on, there's, there's a lesson here for us because we are bound to meet people in their grief. We're bound to meet people in desperate times. And if you're like me, you just, you just want to fix it. You want to make it better for them in the moment, right? And, and, and if I can just explain it, if I can just kind of give you some statement that puts it all in a nice little bow, well, then you'll get it, and then you won't be so sad anymore, right? And when we meet people in grief, sometimes we, <laughs> we just, words spill out of our mouths before we even know what we're doing. We're like, why am I saying this right now? We don't know what to do sometimes. We feel compelled to give answers. And I think Elijah's example for us is so powerful because he doesn't do that. He doesn't try to defend God. He knows that God can defend himself. He doesn't need to stick up for him. He just, he goes and he prays, and it's not just that he prays, it's how he prays. I mean, notice what he does, right? He, he goes and he takes up the anguish and the petition of the widow himself. You know, what he says to God is an echo in some sense of what the woman said to him. Right, verse 20, oh Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand what's going on in the moment, and that's okay. He acknowledges God's sovereignty. He says, God, God clearly you're, you're behind this somehow, so this is not something that you are, are unaware of or surprised by. What are you doing? Why would you do this, God? By the way, that's an okay prayer to pray. Because he's taking his complaint to the Lord, right? He's not just grumbling against the Lord. He, this is a prayer seeking understanding. God can handle those prayers. Because he can't figure out what God is doing. But he takes up the widow's cause and he prays for her. Commentator Dale Davis, he writes of this pattern that Elijah sets for us. He says, do we ever pray like that? Do we place ourselves in the position of other people and plead their anguish before God for them? In such situations, we may think we need to formulate a response or to have an explanation to the person in distress. No, you don't have to have an answer. You have a throne to approach. That's powerful. Far more than being able to, to make sense of and explain God's ways, often we just plead for God to show mercy and show comfort. Far more than our words ever could. But in the midst of this unexpected turn of events, just like with the flour and the oil, God does show himself faithful. And that unexpected tragedy leads to an incredible demonstration. So Elijah, he, he takes this woman's grief to the Lord. He, he, he pleads with God, verse 21, says he stretches himself upon the child three times and he cried out to the Lord. And as he does, he says, O oh Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And, and this is where <laughs> reading with New Testament eyes almost does us a disservice in this moment because I, I think we need to stop and acknowledge what an incredible prayer this is. This has literally never happened before in Scripture. We have seen God do amazing things, but never before has a dead person 
been raised to life. Death is the one inescapable uh, point of no return. And Elijah prays that God would do the impossible. He would raise up this dead child. Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham was prepared to sacrifice Isaac because he believed that God could raise him from the dead. But Elijah has no precedence for this. This has never happened in recorded history. And I would think someone would write that down if it happened before this point. But Elijah's learning to trust at the same time, and his faith is such at this moment that he believes that there is no task impossible for God. And so he prays. Who knows what his state of mind is as he prays, but he prays, God, let this child's life come into him again. And in verse 22, shockingly, the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And he goes... And he delivers the boy back to his mother. He doesn't make a speech. He just says, here's your son. He's alive. And verse 24, this is the statement that I want to focus on as we, as we begin to wrap up here today. She receives her son back from the dead. Amazing. And she says, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Now this lesson of trust I believe, is completed. She's, she's seen God's goodness. She's seen his provision with the flour and the oil, but this, this is something different. This is something utterly unexpected, and in an absolutely undeniable way, she knows the God that you serve is the real thing. This is not like Baal. This is not like any other God that's ever been known. This is a God who works wonders. So why would God let this happen? I I can't know. I wouldn't pretend to. But I think that part of it has to be that he's showing, he's demonstrating his limitless and matchless power to this woman showing her that he is a God worthy of her trust. You may remember in the In the Gospel of John, the disciples come upon a man born blind and they ask Jesus, they say, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There must be an explanation for it, they say. But Jesus tells them, it is not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. It's where the apostles and where this widow saw divine punishment. God was interested in, and showing divine power. And I believe that where she first met Elijah and she swore by the Lord, your God, I believe that now she would come to call him the Lord, my God. Because she's learned what it is to trust in the most desperate of circumstances. And our lives are filled with unexpected circumstances as well sometimes, aren't they? Things don't always go according to plan. And oftentimes those unexpected circumstances are rather unwelcome. Sometimes they're blessings, sometimes they're God's goodness and kindness, but sometimes they're brutally hard. And we, we lose loved ones unexpectedly. Relationships come to unexpected ends. Financial security, job security takes an unexpected turn for the worse. But if we're to learn something this morning, I think that the lesson that we learned today is that no matter how unexpected, how unwelcome our circumstances, God is still able to make incredible provision in the midst of it. And so we are left, like Elijah, to take that fear, to take that anguish, that grief, and take it to God, the one who can restore all things. And to be clear, I can't promise you this morning, I I can't promise you a never-ending supply of sustenance. I can't promise you a life free from suffering, from bad news. I, I can't promise that God will answer the prayer the way that you want him to, but I can promise you this. Jesus said, in the world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Because the provision that you and I have this morning as a sure and steady promise is actually much like the widow experience. It's a resurrection. And it's not 
of a young son of a widow, but of the son of God. Because that young man, he would again grow old, he would face death again one day. But the resurrection that we celebrate this morning is not a delayed death, it is a defeated death. It's a resurrection that ensures all future resurrections, that anyone who places faith in Jesus Christ would share in his resurrection. Amen. Amen. And the provision for us this morning is that God has made a way not to sustain us in this life, but to sustain us in the life to come through eternity, through his son. And if he can do that, if he can provide victory over the grave and provide for our forever, then we can trust him at every moment in between. Because Jesus has made that great provision for us. We celebrate and we sing and we trust when we don't see a way forward. God will continue to cultivate that in us. May we be grateful for those blessings, those those evidences of his grace, those demonstrations of his power. May we learn, like Elijah and this woman, that our faith in him is never misplaced. Let's pray. God, you have shown yourself faithful. There are a hundred stories in this room of it right now. Some seemingly mundane and others dramatic and incredible. But none is more incredible than you making a way for sinners and rebels and lost souls to be welcomed into your family through the cross of Christ. God, as we sing, as we pray, as we look to him, we pray that we would learn to trust through every circumstance, unexpected and otherwise, that you lead us through in this life. We pray it in Jesus' name.